Miles Turner is looking different recently. How so? What's different about his offense and why is it helping the Pacers? Plus, what scenarios face the Pacers in the standings this week and what's key to beat the Raptors tonight? We'll break it all down today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. up y'all happy tuesday and welcome into another edition of the locked on pacers podcast where we of course talk about the indiana pacers as always my name is tony east i cover the team for forbes and si and today i've got my indy final four shirt on goodbye college basketball it was a very fun season to my purdue listeners i'm very sorry hopefully this is a reprieve we will not be talking about purdue at all today to my eclipse enjoyers I undersold it. That was sweet. And to my Pacers enjoyers, which is probably everybody, we have a lot to get to today. We're going to start talking about Miles Turner. He just had a big game against the Heat, and I wanted to dive into some of his stats, particularly since Pascal Siakam became a Pacer. I also want to talk about scenarios facing the Pacers this week, mostly because I got a really interesting tweet that made me think about their standings this week. Not standings watch in terms of making the playoffs. We'll get into that tomorrow, but more so about stuff that that could happen to them given other numbers of wins and we'll close looking at the raptors their opponent tonight who will be missing a key player due to just straight up rest very interesting and some draft pick scenarios involved in that game we start with one miles turner who was just very great against the heat double double at halftime 22 points 13 boards against bam at bio who typically typically has been a tricky matchup for him now, I believe it's been said before that, you know, ever since the Team USA 2019 experience, Bam thought he should have been on that team, you know, took takes that matchup a little more personal. I've never asked Bam that, but, you know, either way, that matchup has typically gone well for Adebayo, and Miles was fantastic in that game. And I was looking back through a lot of podcasts I've done. I've th- done a lot of diving into several players in the team's rotation, even some out of it. And I haven't talked enough about Turner recently, so I really wanted to start with him and uh, the number that jumped out to me when I looked at Miles Turner's stats since the All-Star break is both his three-point attempts per game, 4.5 per game in the 22 games since the All-Star break, and the percentage being very high at 39. And that includes not doing so well in the four games they played in February out of the break. He started off making four of his first 15 coming out of the break, and he's still at 39% in that span. He's been shooting very well on good volume, averaging over 16 points a game on 11 shots, 50% from the field. I don't want to read stats for forever, but that's kind of where I started and was like, where is this little tiny uptick in his shot diet change coming from and how has it been working for the Pacers? Because he's up to his three-point volume, 4.4 per game would be a career high for him, really closer to 4.5, whereas in general, his shooting percentage would be lower, but that's because he's shooting more threes. And so I wanted to pair that in with Siakam when Pascal Siakam joined the team, because if you'll recall, we just talked about last week, the Siakam Halliburton numbers. Well, a big thing with this trade was Siakam even said it like playing with someone like Miles Turner's rim protection has always been something he admired. Their pairing makes a lot of sense defensively, but offensively, finally, the Pacers who all season had been dealing with four men guarding Miles Turner and five men guarding whoever's at the four, Obi Toppin, Jalen Smith, whoever, they can't do that anymore. And because Siakam is occasionally, more so recently even, a screener, Turner's involved in actions differently. So what do his numbers look like? How is his involvement coming? How is he making these shots? What is what is actually changing for him to be effective besides just making more threes? 39% is great. He had a very down stretch in December shooting the ball, a little bit even so in January. And so I, the, a little bit of a heater of late. But I wanted to start with his straight-up three-point attempt rate with and without Pascal Siakam this season. Without Pascal Siakam this season, 172 of Miles Turner's 521 shots without Siakam on the floor with him are threes. That's 33%. With Siakam on the floor, 136 of his 350 shots have been threes. That's 39%. So 6% difference. If you consider he takes 10 shots a game, that means every two games he's taking one extra three than he was before. Like that's a, that sounds so small, but that actually is a significant shot diet change, especially midseason. And I noted that to say, I think that ties in very well with 
something I talked about last week, which is something the Pacers are doing well now with Siakam is Siakam will occasionally set up like a not real just to see what the defense is going to do screen for Halberton at the start of possessions or early in possessions. And if there's a switch or if they just get a matchup they like, they just go to Siakam in the post. He's posting up a lot with the Pacers and his efficiency on those has been spectacular. That's been one of his best play types for the Pacers. Well, when he is working inside like that, that basically requires Miles Turner to be a spacer. In fact, I think the fact that Siakam is having such a wonderful time being efficient on these post-ups is because he's playing on a much better shooting team, and that's made possible by, one, having a center who can and is willing to shoot threes and make them, but two, the whole team has to be able to do that, and the Raptors, we'll talk about later, are not a good shooting team. So that's something that stood out to me right away is, Yes, Miles Turner's good at a number of things. It's not just that he's a shooting big man, but that does make him pair well with Siakam. And it was fascinating to me to see 6% growth in his three-point attempt rate with Siakam on the team. And I think that ties in well with Siakam's best skills as well. But the numbers don't just stop there, right? There's there's a lot more to this kind of jump in, in, his, in where his shots are coming from and all sorts of stuff like that. For example... Uh, the 40.45% from deep he's shooting. Sorry, I just got lost in my numbers here with Pascal Siakam on the floor. Fantastic. They're open shots. And I think that speaks to what something that was also talked about when the trade happened. And I just mentioned it is he's being guarded by fives now. And I don't want to rehash that point. What I mean to say is like what we've seen a lot is th this happened with the thunder and two matchups. And this is, does not happen with the heat, but has happened often younger centers aren't awesome at defending post-ups. And so when Miles Turner can go inside and out because he's been efficient in both areas, they really struggle when he when they're reacting to what he's doing, right? And so because now they have to guard Turner all the time, they can't guard fours anymore when they're playing the Pacers, that means he's getting easier chances just by playing next to Pascal Siakam. And so he's making them. And he deserves credit for that because at point, point parts of the season, holy cow, am I tripping over my words this segment? parts of the season, he was not making them, right? I think his percentage got as low as 34, 33 this year. Well, recently that has ticked back up because of many factors, but one being the matchups he's getting, the guys guarding him, make more sense for him to be unlocked as a spacer, as a guy beyond the arc. And so I, I've been fascinated to see those numbers in particular be a big part of his jump and his growth in the offense with the Pacers. And that's something that will always be there to me. How many teams have really great defensive four and really great defensive five. And both of them are mobile and both of them could shut down both options. Very few in the NBA, right? That's why that duo has been so good together. And you look at the Pacers with Siakam and Turner on pretty good offensive rating, 117 and a half and a pretty good defensive rating. And that is a plus 1.3 net rating, regardless of the other players on the floor, even if Halburn is not involved in those moments. And they're playing a lot together. And I think this is the number that, of all things, says how much the Pacers believe in that front court pairing. Since the trade, right, in games that Siakam and Turner have both played, Miles Turner and Siakam together, 770 minutes. Miles Turner knows Siakam, only 135 minutes. So 770 out of 905 minutes in those games together. 85% of Miles Turner's minutes in games him and Siakam both play, they share the floor because the Pacers believe so much in that duo and how they work together. And you're seeing how that impacts Miles Turner stats, particularly since the break when they've gotten their feet under them and have been better. But Siakam plays with the bench, right? He has 309 minutes without Miles Turner. That's over twice as much as the inverse, right? And those minutes go fantastic. Well, we talked about Siakam plus the bench ad nauseum. But the numbers just like intuitively, if you watch the Pacers and predicted what the, the Siakam trade could do for multiple members of the team, intuitively this has all kind of gone with Turner what it seemed like it should have his matchups would make more sense for him to be used as a spacer occasionally on switches he's going to punish either inexperienced post-up centers or smalls if teams try to get cute with him and, and, tr and try to let him be the guy to score and he can unlock things for Siakam as well because when he's spacing like this Siakam's post-ups are way easier so that's why Turner has been better, I think, since the break and since the trade. Everything about his role is easier now. His matchups, his shot diet, the players he shares the court with almost all the time. That's why his numbers are so much better. That's why he's playing better. And that's why he's been a more pivotal piece for this team since the break. And is climbing statistically in many ways. Per 36 minutes 
22.4 points for Miles Turner this season. That is a career high. Per 36 minutes, 9.2 rebounds for Miles Turner. That is tied for a career high. His three-point percentage is climbing. His volume from deep per 36 minutes, guess what? Career high. He's figuring it out, what he needs to do with the Pacers, how he needs to do it, and it's been clicking recently, both statistically and in the win column. He was vital in their victory Sunday. I think he will be again tonight against the Raptors. We'll talk more about them later because the next thing I want to talk about is related to winning this Raptors game for the Pacers. There's scenarios for the week. They can still finish anywhere from two to eight with three games left. And I'm going to talk about how, what that looks like, what the Pacers do and don't have their own control over this week, stuff they're rooting for. This is separate from standings. Watch a little bit. This is more about just scenarios at play, but we'll do a little bit of standings watching every day this week because every game has some sort of ripple effect on other games throughout the league. It's just how it's going to be. And the Pacers can, in theory, clinch a playoff spot as early as Tuesday. Today, if you're listening to the day this comes out, we'll dive into that coming right up. But first, we have to talk about LinkedIn jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. They have a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. And LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within one day, 24 hours. And LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing a ton of hats, might not have the time and resources to hire. So they're always making the process easier. They have a new feature that helps you write job descriptions, which, again, even easier and quicker. Two and a half million businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. You could be next. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown MBA. Again, that's linkedin.com slash lockdown MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And we are back here on Lockdown Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Locked on Raptors. Pacers opponent tonight. They're resting a player. They're fighting to keep their pick, it appears at least in the top six of the inverse standings. So they traded away a top six protected pick in this draft. Very interesting dynamics at play for the Raptors, which we'll cover in the third segment. But Sean Woodley can tell you all about Jordan Wara, Bruce Brown, and the rest of the Raptors ahead of that game tonight. Hey, are you watching Fox Sports and ESPN on your TV all day? You have to turn it down because of all the shouting. Well, make the switch for your sports shows to Locked On Sports today. Free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for your everyday to bring you the biggest stories without the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you the can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or on Amazon Fire TV's channels at part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's talk scenarios for the Pacers this week. Here's what got me going on doing this segment. I got a tweet today. I'm going to shout out the person who sent it to me. I very rarely just impromptu get a prompt and run with it. Christian Campbell at Scout the Player tweets at me and says, Tony, Correct me if I'm wrong. If Cleveland goes two and one the rest of the way with their loss being to Indiana and Milwaukee goes one and three and the Pacers win out, would the Pacers win the Central Division? And I thought, wow, I and every other person tracking this have been so locked into the Pacers making the playoffs or catching other teams or whatever. I haven't even thought about the Central Division, which doesn't really matter. Here's the thing, though. For the Pacers to win the Central Division, they would make the playoffs. There is no scenario where they would win the division, given the remaining games for every team in the East, and not make the playoffs. So <laughs> this is sort of interesting in that way, in that, yeah, it'd be cool to have that happen. The laid-out scenario that I just read from Christian is accurate. If the Bucks close with a moderately hard schedule, but not that hard, and aren't playing very well. They go one or three or worse. That's it. The Bucs are the only team to think about because the Cavs, Pacers control their destiny currently to pass the Cavs. The Bucs go one or three or worse the rest of the way. Let me read the Bucs schedule just because I know it. They play the Magic twice. They play the Thunder and they play the Celtics. Uh, but it, that is to be in order and accurate. Bucks host the Celtics, host the Magic at OKC at Orlando to close. The fact that they play the Magic twice is relevant. We'll get to that later. If the Bucs go 1-3 and three in those four games or 0-4, oh the Pacers control their own destiny to win the Central Division. That's pretty cool. That's not something I even thought would be possible to discuss. Pacers have the best record in the East of the top 10 teams across the last 10 games, except for the Mighty Celtics, who are just a machine, an unbeatable machine. 
So who knows? Perhaps that's something on the table. But that is more relevant to tracking the Bucks than tracking the Pacers the rest of the way. Let's talk about some other scenarios, though. Bucks playing the Magic twice actually kind of makes things confusing for the rest of the season from a Pacers seeding perspective because the Pacers are trying to catch, in theory, both of those teams if they play well the rest of the way. Uh, so what I want to do here is everybody knows this, and I'll mention it again later more directly, but the Pacers control their own destiny for not only a playoff spot, but the fifth seed, the fifth seed, not the sixth seed where they are now, the fifth seed, because if they went out, they play the Cavs Friday, they would pass the Cavs via tiebreaker by beating them. Pacers go undefeated. They would be the fifth seed at worst in the Eastern Conference. But their scenarios go far beyond that. Here are the scenarios for the Pacers this week. They can, if they control their own destiny and go 3-0, get the two seed if all of the following happen. The Bucks go one and three or worse. And the problem is they play the Magic twice. The win for the Bucks has to come against the Orlando Magic, one of them. Because if they win another game, but only go one and three, then that would mean by default, the Orlando Magic won two games in the last week here of the season which matters because if the magic win twice they'll have 48 wins the pacers peak wins would be 48 but they can't actually win the tiebreaker with the magic because the magic have the head-to-head -head against the pacers and are going to win their division so the only way the pacers can get the two seed is if the bucks lose three times the rest of the season and their one win is against orlando and the magic beat the Bucs in that other game, but win all, lose all the rest of their games. So the Magic also have to stink the rest of the way. And so the Bucks and Magic have to split, uh, and the Magic lose their other three games. And the Knicks have to lose twice. If all that magical nonsense comes together, hey, guess what? The Pacers can, in fact, get the two seed. But that would be, I mean, that would just, <laughs> that's like too many things going their way. That's like 10 different games going a specific way. It's very unreasonable to assume that happens. The Magic are playing okay. The Knicks are playing okay. The Knicks have some easy games in there. The Knicks have to lose at least twice for any of that to be possible. So the two seed is on the table for the Pacers, which is insane to say, but that's the reality for them. For them to get the three seed, only two of those three things that I just described between the Bucks record, the Magic record, and the Knicks record has to happen. This is at least possible to me. Like it doesn't require an insane number of permutations of things going the Pacers way. For example, Bucks go 0 and 4, Knicks lose twice. Pacers can get to three if they go undefeated. Uh, or the Magic go 0 and 4, and the Knicks lose twice. Th that's also possible. Again, because the Bucks and Magic play each other, it's really hard for this to all go perfectly for the Pacers. They have to exactly split those for them to get to two. But it is three is reasonable, especially if one of those teams stumbles like the Bucks have been where the Magic can't get it together late in the season. And of course, the Pacers have to win, right? That is relevant in all these scenarios is the Pacers actually have to win out. Three seed, though, a little more logical. Two seed, very, very, very less than 0.1% chance likely. Four seed for the Pacers. What do they have to do to get the four seed? Go undefeated, and one of those things mentioned happens. Either Bucks go 0-4 or 1-3, or the Magic goes 1-3 or 0-4, or, or the Knicks go 2-2 two two or worse. Any of those things happen and the Pacers go undefeated, they would get the four seed, right? Even in some crazy three-way tiebreakers, they'd be ahead of a lot of these teams because they smoked the Bucks in that head-to-head -head series, and they did better than the Knicks. And the Magic, in most of these scenarios, would be the division champion. They only aren't if the Heat uh, catch them, and if the Magic win one more time, that is not possible. And, of course, the easiest scenario for the Pacers, the five seed, undefeated, they'll get the fifth seed, no matter what happens elsewhere. If the Knicks, Magic, and Bucks all win every game, not against each other, the Pacers win out, they get the five seed, right? That is on the table for them right now. We'll see what happens. Of course, a lot has to go their way. For them to get the six seed guaranteed, the Pacers have to go at least two and one. They can't afford a loss. They shouldn't want to do that to themselves. And then any loss by both of the Heat and Sixers decreases the number of wins the Pacers have to get to clinch the six seed, but they both have to lose. Not just one of them can lose. Uh, the Sixers schedule is a joke. But anyway, any seed two through eight, still theoretically possible for the Pacers. Any division seed one through three is still technically possible for the Pacers who have, I didn't know this till today when looking it up. The Pacers have the fewest central division titles since the brawl of any team in the division because the Pistons, of course, had the mid-2000s run. 
The Bulls had a couple in there in the Derrick Rose, Jimmy Butler era. The Cavs with LeBron. The Bucks recently, I think they've won the last six or five. Pacers only have two total. The two years they made the conference finals. Um, so they actually have the fewest Central Division titles in the last two decades. I'm not saying it means something. In fact, specifically for the Pacers, it does not. Right? It, the, the tiebreaker of winning the Central Division doesn't really matter to them because every team that they would be pitted against in a tiebreaker, that that would come up. They already have it anyway, but it could be cool. They haven't done it in a long time, this era of team making the playoffs, and doing so would be fantastic. And doing that would pretty much require beating the Raptors tonight. In theory, they could win the division without it, but every scenario for the Pacers involves them ideally winning the rest of their games. And that starts tonight. Let's take a brief look at their opponent, the Toronto Raptors, the keys to the game against the Toronto team that is uh, not playing very well, to put it mildly. But before we get to any of that, let's talk about game time, an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Game time is the best place to get tickets to any event, sports, comedy, theater, whatever, and tickets and prices on the game time app actually go down the closer event gets to the first pitch. Killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from receipt, Lowest price guarantee, all the things that make game time the best place to buy tickets. There's no guesswork, right? You know what it's going to cost. You know what you're going to see when you get there. You know you're getting the cheapest price because they'll actually credit you the difference. If you find tickets in the same section or row for less. How do I know game time is this awesome? I used it in New York. I wanted to go see the Dallas Wings play the New York Liberty. I saw the seat view I was going to get from my seat. I saw the all-in price, so there was no fees at the end, and it was exactly as I wanted. It was absolutely fantastic. Try it yourself. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NBA for a twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, terms apply. Create an account, redeem the code L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And we're back here on Locked On Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day. For your second lesson, check out Locked On College Basketball to recap the end of the college hoop season. We'll dive into the draft here on Locked On Pacers once their season's over. Usually, the last three years, we've already started that, but this year, not the case with the playoffs potentially looming for the Pacers. Apologies for any weird cuts in the video or audio that you're hearing right now. I've had to get up because uh, I have food poisoning right now, and I'm trying to power through the rest of this show, but you don't care. Let's talk some Pacers, Raptors. Very interesting game, of course. Look, here's the thing about the Pacers. They have not earned the trust of anyone to win this game. They have not won three games in a row since the All-Star break. They have routinely won two in a row and then had a, an easier opponent in the third game and come up short oh, constantly, right? Brooklyn, just last week, that is preventing the Pacers right now from a five-game winning streak is that Brooklyn game they played last week. In uh, Chicago at home, the DeRozan miracle game prevented them from that winning streak too. It's just, it hasn't quite been there for this Pacers team. The Toronto home game that we're about to talk about the Raptors late February, where they were winning in the fourth quarter, ended up losing by eight, giving up 130. Their defense was awful that night. Over and over, they've been close and haven't been able to do it. And tonight they have another chance to do it. The difference is, I kind of said this last week and was wrong. The cards are down. This is it. This is the season this week. If they go two and one, they're in the playoffs. The Raptors, are an interesting team before we dive into their actual basketball. I thought this game was fascinating. I talked to Dave Searle about this yesterday in that the Raptors have the Pacers first round pick this year of every team that wants the Pacers in the lottery, which includes of course the heat and 76ers, the Raptors are the top of the list. If the Raptors were going to try one more time this season, to me, it would have been this Tuesday night game. And try is a stretch. Players always try organizations don't always try. The Raptors are two wins right now behind the Grizzlies, and the Raptors have won two straight games. Uh, the Raptors have four more. The Grizzlies also have four more. Uh, the Raptors have a top six protected first-round pick outbound right now to the Spurs. They would like to finish with the sixth-worst record. That's where they currently are. They have to be careful about winning the rest of the way. Uh, their schedule isn't hard necessarily, but they, they, do have, they do have to think about that. But beating the Pacers and then losing out, would still get them what they want and potentially help their lottery pick. But they play the Nets uh, on Wednesday. Who knows what motivations the Heat will have for those games. Meanwhile, the Grizzlies, who they're chasing, I mean, 
every team's schedule is kind of weird at the stage, but the Grizzlies' schedule is moderately hard. They play the Spurs, who are trying, and Wembenyama is amazing, and then Cavs, Lakers, Nuggets, who are all certainly trying. So there's a chance the Grizzlies lose out, and the Raptors have to be careful. So perhaps they don't really organizationally go for it. We'll see. I don't want to look too much into that, but the flip side is, and the part I didn't mention yesterday with Dave is, the Pacers have the Raptors' second-round pick, and so the Pacers beating the Raptors could actually help make that pick better uh, or at least secure it as the 36th pick, no chance it moves to 37th, all sorts of stuff like that. So that would, of course, be valuable for the Pacers. Uh, so they have motivations to win even beyond their record looking forward to those dynamics how they play out. Because all we know so far is Emmanuel Quickly, who scored 31 for the Raptors in a win over the weekend, is out for rest. Just rest is the designation. If that's any indication of what you'll see from the Raptors, who knows? The thing about the Raptors that fascinates me the most in this game is they are a terrible shooting team, which um, actually I think plays into the Pacers' hands with Quickly out a lot more than it did or would have otherwise. And also is relevant because when the Raptors beat the Pacers in Indy in a kind of stunning result, they shot it well, 43% from deep that night. But this season, Toronto is 26th in the league in three-point percentage right now at 34.9%. Here are their top 10 three-point shooters this season entering the game you're about to see. R.J. Barrett, 40.7%. Gary Trent Jr., 40.4%. That's their top two guys. They're both playing. Then it's Emmanuel Quickly out. O.J. Ananobi on the Knicks. Grady Dick hurt. Dennis Schroeder on the Nets, Malachi Flynn on the Pistons, Otto Porter hurt, Scotty Barnes hurt, Jonte Porter being investigated for illegal gambling activity. That's Chris Boucher hurt. So of their top 11 three-point shooters this season, there's a chance only two of them, granted it's the best two, are available to play. So that is thing number one, two, and three for me for the Pacers in this game. If they can limit the Raptors to a crummy or average shooting night given their available personnel, I think that would go a long way for the Pacers in – giving themselves a great chance to win. They can out-efficiency this Raptors offense, to me, very easily. Right, The Raptors are 24th in offense. They're so good at cutting. Remember, they cut the Pacers to death in Indy uh, when they scored 130 in late uh, in late February. This game is all about defense for the Pacers, right? Containing those shooters, containing guards, attacking the rim. But if they can limit their shooting of those two guys, R.J. Barrett and, and Gary Trent Jr., I think that alone would give the Pacers a good chance to actually do their thing because the Raptors cannot shoot right now. I mean, even if you just look at their their season, their schedule, right? They beat the Pacers in late February. They have three wins since. They were 22 and 36 at the time. Um, they are now, I can't believe I can't find this, they are now 25 and 30, 53. So obviously not playing well. They lost 15 in a row at one point. The Pacers should be able to beat them. I think the shooting is the biggest thing. Uh, the other thing that, the Raptors try to do is they play pretty disruptive defense. Like they try to their eighth and steals. They try to be a transition team. They're pretty good there. Their rim defense isn't particularly good though. They give up the 23rd most two point shots, 26th best percentage of shots inside the arc. And they foul out. They give up the fourth most free throws per game. They're a younger, younger team. None of these are like surprising numbers, but all this kind of speaks to the same thing to me. If they want to prevent the Raptors from getting, their easy chances and make sure the Pacers are playing their own style, scoring when they want. What does this all mean? Well, contain the shooters and the Pacers guards need to attack the rim. Tyrese Halberton was good at this at key moments against the Heat when they beat the Pistons and he took three threes. He was really good at this. I think this is a Halberton drive game. Get to the basket, establish himself as a player that way and build out from there. TJ McConnell always plays that way, should be and is an important game for him. Andrew Nemhard attacking the rim. Don't settle for those you know, 10, 15 footers. Oh, he's been making those pretty well recently. And I think that is all very key. Pascal Siakam, of course, did well against Toronto, attacking the rim when the Pacers did beat the Raptors this season. Those are the two biggest keys for me. Pacers guards take care of the ball so the Raptors don't get in transition and attack the rim, play inside out, force them to foul, force them to play rim defense. Siakam hurdles out, right? That's thing one. And thing two is limit the Raptors shooters to the extent that's actually possible within their offense. But they have some offensive engines out, both Scotty Barnes and quickly listed out, that could make it hard for the Raptors to generate good shots anyway. And there are all these keys and they're all important, but the Pacers just need to, like, this is what Tyrese Halberton said after the heat game, right? This is what it, this is what the whole season is for the Pacers. Halberton said, feels good. It doesn't matter how you get it. You've just got to get it right. That's what the Pacers mentality has to be. They have to win every game the rest of the way. They control their own destiny. You can find little things that I just did about how the Pacers can win all these games individually, but they just got to win. And if they do so, They'll need to go one and one over the weekend to secure a playoff berth. And you know we'll cover all that here 
on the Lockdown Pacers podcast tomorrow. We'll talk Pacers Raptors and do an official standings watch given Tuesday's results and look at what the Pacers updated scenarios are. We'll have a guest Thursday. We'll look ahead to the weekend Friday. Lots of fun stuff coming here on the show this week. If I said something dumb, you can find me on Twitter at Tony R. East and the show at Locked On Pacers. Back tomorrow talking Pacers Raptors and plenty more. Tell then everybody have a wonderful day.